Thank you, thank you. Great to be here. I've been excited to come to Fusion. Um, it's been a while since I've been here. It's been six years since I've been able to be at Fusion, and I used to come every year, um, and I had to come every year. Um, but we started, um, I was the children's ministries director for 10 years, um, and then Brent Colby came, and then Josh, we hired Josh Wood, we brought him over to Montana, and, um, and then he came back here. And isn't it great to have Josh Wood here leading children's ministries for the network? I love it, love it, love it. Josh was our, I, I knew Josh, we went on a trip together um, to uh, Southern California to check out some churches. He was what you call, let's see if I can remember, it's a loser position, youth pastor. And, um, <laughs> and, and so um, we, we, he, he came along with the youth pastors. We took some awesome children's pastors and we went down there and, and um, we were on a plane ride back um, from, from California. He had, had a Jesus moment. You probably shared the story. Maybe you're sharing it tomorrow. I don't know. Um, but um, he came up to me and he goes, hey, can I talk with you? And I go, no, I'm going to take a nap. And um, is that how it goes? Is it long? I don't believe that. Yeah. So that's a, I think he was drunk. But, um, um, and then, um, but he came back and it was neat to see God had called him to kids ministries and been making a difference. So let me tell you what he did in Kalispell. When, when he came to Kalispell, we were running maybe 100 kids um, that we had been reaching in our community. And we left, we were running over 500 kids um, in our kids ministries. A great leader. Um, and we are, um, him and, and Bethy are wonderful people. Let me tell you, you are blessed to follow his leadership. Um, so reach out and get to know him and um, pick his brain because he has a brilliant brain. And if you're hitting a wall or you're struggling with something, you can continue to hit the wall or you can reach out and say, how would you do this? And then you get free ideas. You don't even have to pay for them. Okay? And here's the coolest thing. He'll take you to coffee and pay for it. And he likes to eat. He'll take you to lunch and pay for it. And he'll come to your town. Am I, is this right? Yeah, no, I'm not. Not about the eating part. You'll go to their town. Come on. And, um, and, buy, and take them to lunch. And you'll pay for it. Okay. So, so there it is. There it is. Um, who would, I mean, so even if you don't like him and you want free food. He's your hookup. This is how it works, people. Take advantage of the network. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. Well, my name is Kevin. Um, I have um, um, pastored in Kalispell, Montana for six years, and I've loved doing it. God, um, you know, my middle daughter's middle name, I have five children from 17 to four years old, so I'm still at full-time children's ministries. Um, but my son is with me, Connor. If you could just wave your hand, Connor, real quick. He's my 15-year-old. It's great to have him here. He's going to be a worship pastor someday. Um, hopefully he goes to a cheap college. But we, um, I've been pastoring for six years in Kalispell, Montana, at a church called Canvas. And it's been fun to um, just make a difference in your community, see a lot of people get saved. But I, I started as a children's pastor when I was 12 years old. And nobody wanted to do children's ministries when I um, was 12, which was a problem. Because my dad's the pastor. That means I had to go listen to him preach which is not what I wanted to do. I did that all week long. And um, so I asked my dad if I could be um, the children's pastor. And he found um, a, a lady who was about 65 years old, knew all of my dad's sermons. And so she sat downstairs in this church in Glendive, Montana. And I would listen to Dan and Louie tapes. Tapes like a square thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I would listen to Dan, and I would retell those stories to these kids at the age of 12, 13, 14. In fact, I remember this one time. I'll tell this story, then we'll get to the message. Um, we weren't allowed to wear jeans to church, um, but, but then Dad changed his mind, and now you could wear um, um, not blue jeans, but you could wear white or black jeans to church. <laughs> Do you remember that in the Bible? Yeah, me neither. But, um, <laughs> but you could wear, now wear white and black jeans to church. This is a big deal in in, um, in Glendive. So I had this white, I had two, a white pair of jeans. I had a play pair of white jeans and then a church pair of white jeans. And so I was speaking, I was about 14, 14, 15 years um, old at the time, and um, I was teaching children's church downstairs, and I was getting to the moment, you know, where um, 
I, I was building this moment to where kids were going to give their life to Jesus. And I've been, it, was a, it was an awesome moment. And, I, and you know, when you guys are kids perfections here, and um, you, you want to get eye level with kids. So, I, you know, I, I got down with eye level so I could bring the kids home. And they were going to, you know, they were going to be like a five-year-old who got saved. And their mom played the piano. And, and you know, going to come to church. And, and then someday their grandkid would get up and tell this emotional story. And so th this... <laughs> This, this moment was happening for me, okay? And, and I came down to like this so I could really communicate it to their level. And this little girl on the front row, I mean, God was moving on her life. She couldn't wait for the end. She was just ready to get saved right away. And I said, put your hand down, honey. It's coming. It's coming. So I'm talking about the, the, the blood of Jesus who washes away our sin. She's like, and I go, no, honey, it's coming. Just, just wait. She goes, you have red under her on. And I looked down, I had a hole in my crotch like this. <laughs> and I was wearing flaming red underwear. And I went like this. No joke, honey, the blood of Jesus was red. I don't know if you know that little girl's name, but um, she is the mother of Billy Graham. So just saying. <laughs> just saying. Here's the other thing I realized. When I jumped down to tell that story, I realized there's no way I'm jumping back up there. So, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have some fun. I get to speak a couple of times. Tomorrow I'm doing a leadership lesson um, on, I call it watermelon leadership, um, just some principles to help you lead better. Um, and, and I love leadership. I, I, I enjoy talking about leadership. I'm teaching a workshop I'm excited about on healthy culture, how to create a healthy culture and reproduce a healthy culture. But if we can just put a, a hold on leadership for a second, and I, I just wanna um, address your heart issues today and this evening. And here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna do a message out of Joshua um, because Josh told me I had to speak out of Joshua because he wanted his name mentioned a whole bunch of times. But, um, no, I'm teasing. But I'm gonna speak out of Joshua chapter one, um, a, a text that many of you know. Um, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna work my way through it and I'm going to bring up and ask some heartfelt questions. And at the very end, worship team is going to come up. I'm going to tell a story at the very end. And, and then um, I'm going to open up the front for a time of response. And I don't want you to wait. I want you to wait to come to the front to pray at the end. Don't come up in the middle of my message. That would be awkward, okay? I mean, we're Pentecostals, but we're not crazy. So, um, so, so, so you can come up at the end. But here's the deal. I don't want you to wait to the end to determine why you're going to come up and pray. And don't we often do that? We listen to a message and then there's a moment to respond and then we go, what should I respond about? But here's what's gonna happen. As I'm preaching, the Holy Spirit's gonna be speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit's gonna be pinging your heart. And the Holy Spirit's gonna be nudging your heart. And in that moment, just say, this is why I'm here. This is what this message is for me. And then you don't have to wait to the very end to know why, but at the very end when it's time to respond, the Holy Spirit where I've already quickened your heart to respond. And then when that moment comes, I want you to just come find a place to pray. And we're worship team is going to sing. And we're just going to worship the Lord for a while. You know, we don't get too many opportunities to do what we're about to do. Well, let's take advantage of it. So here's how I'm going to pray for us as we get going. That the Lord would open up our ears so we would hear what he has to say to us. That the, or, that the Lord would open up our hearts. So we'll be responsive to it. You know, the David, prayer of David, search my heart. Search my heart. Um, and then, Lord, touch my feet. Touch my feet that will be obedient to walk in the direction you want me to go. So let's pray that way, and then let's go on this journey, and then let's just see what God's going to do. Sound like fun? Okay, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to come across from all the state of Washington, northern Idaho, um, to be here in this moment in Yakima. Um, and, and you know what you're going to do. And <laughs> we're excited to see what you are going to do. Um, we thank you for the leadership that's here that has set up this opportunity. Now, may we be people who take advantage of it. May we take advantage of this opportunity that you are going to speak to us because your word never returns void. Your word demands a response. Um, so may we respond appropriately because we're going to have ears to hear. Will you just pray over your life? Lord, give me ears to hear. And Father, would you give us hearts that are responsive? Would you just pray that over your life? Father, give me a heart that's responsive. And then, Father, touch our feet by the anointing of your Holy Spirit to go. Would you just pray that way over your feet, that they will move to do what he wants you to do, I pray. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said.
Amen. You know, I was thinking, before I jump in again, one more little introduction thing. We did an event um, when I was leading the children's ministries for the Northwest. We did an event called Power Surge right here. It was the start of Nitro. It was like the precursor to Nitro. And, and Nick Calum, raise your hand up, Nick, Nick, Nick. There you go. You were here at Power Surge. You were running the lights, I think, um, right up there. And, and um, we had a cougar in here, um, and, and the cougar peed right here. And it cost me like 400 bucks to replace the carpet on this stage. Um, why didn't they have this stuff then? It would have been a lot cheaper. Um, but I remember that cougar peeing in this room. Isn't that awesome? And I don't know if you know this or not, but cougar urine is one of the worst smelling things. Anyway, just a random thought I had. And um, you should be used to it. Um, you're, you work with kids with ADD. I just speak with ADD, okay? Um, so that, that's funny. Here we go. Joshua. Joshua, listen to this, one of my favorite characters of the Bible. This is one of my favorite texts in the Bible. Moses is called to ministry at the burning bush. It is my favorite message of all time, but I'm not preaching that one. I'm preaching on Joshua. And, and Moses is dead. Uh, Moses had just died. They, they buried him. You know, worms are eating his body probably it's soon. And Joshua's in charge now. Um, and in fact, it says, Joshua chapter 1, 1, take your Bible if you have it and go there. And it says this, um, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide, here's what he said. Listen to what, this is the commissioning moment for Joshua. Joshua's just becoming in lead of Israel. So this is a big deal. And, and he's getting his job description. It's like, this is where you sit down with your boss, and your boss is going to be telling you what you're going to be doing, and, and you want to know, you know, what all your responsibilities are going to be, and how much you're going to get paid. Here it is, right here. Okay, and it says this. Moses, my servant, is dead, which you've already emphasized that, but thanks again. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. So Joshua, he's, he's about to lead these people into um, the promised land. you got to remember when you're reading this and to understand the story and its complexity and its, all of its detail, Joshua's been here before. He's been right here under the leadership of Moses ready to go into the promised land, and what happened? They decided they didn't want to go. They got scared, and, you know, for, for, uh, for 40 days, they searched out the land, days and nights. They looked at the promised land. They came back. Ten of the spies didn't want to go. Joshua and Caleb, oh, he was one of the ones that were checking it out. He wanted to go. The ten spies created this great gossip change, got everybody scared, and then they decided not to go. And so Moses gets in front of them and says, fine, for every day you spe spent in the promised land looking at it, you're going to spend a year in the wilderness. That's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness, by the way. They spent 40 days checking out the land. And how did the people of Israel respond? They attacked the promised land. They didn't want to wander for 40 years. And it's one of the saddest verses in the Bible because it says, and the Lord did not go with them. You read that and you go, what? Because I didn't go with them. Because they were walking in disobedience. Now I want you to remember that phrase because I'm going to end with that phrase at the very, 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 very end of the message. It's going to be like three hours later. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep reading. A little bit of background there. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, to all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is promising to Joshua all these things that he was going to do through, through him. And Joshua was sitting there, and Joshua was listening to this. And I, and I like to put myself in the story. I like to think, if I was Joshua... And God was speaking to me, and I don't know how this was happening, how it was being communicated, um, but Joshua um, was hearing it. Um, I, I don't know how I would respond. Kevin, you're going to do this, and you're going go to you're gonna go all the way to the Hittites, and you're going to do all this. I, you know what I feel as the Lord's talking to me? This weight of responsibility start to come on my shoulders. And I'd be like, oh, oh, I got to do this. I got to do this because it's interesting when a clear vision is given and I have to fulfill it. I look at who I am and it starts to get pretty scary because Joshua is human. So you know that the insecurity of who Joshua is was probably playing in his mind. The doubt that he could accomplish what Moses couldn't accomplish. 
the most humble man that ever lived. So he told him about himself. And how do we know that? Because I think the next text that we read, Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, no one knows us like God knows us. And he knows how we think. Like he created humanity. So he knows how we process. And if we'll open up our ears to him, he'll always answer our question every before the question forms in our mind. That's what I've learned about Jesus in my own life. That he often gets me an, an answer, I don't even know the question. And then at some day, I'll ask myself a question and I'll reflect on my life and I'll reflect on the things that God has taught me and he answered it way back here. And this is what he was doing to Joshua. Because in Joshua chapter six, verse um, one through nine, by the way, this is worth committing to memory. It's encouraging and it's challenging and, and it holds the, the, the key to keeping us moving in life. Here's what he says. He says, be strong and courageous. You don't tell someone to be strong and courageous unless maybe that's the area that they're doubting. And not only does God tell Joshua this one time, how many times does he tell him? Three times he says, be strong and courageous. Three times God says, I'm going to do all of these things. And he's looking at Joshua and Joshua's eyes are like this big. And he goes, be strong and courageous. And every time he says it, verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9, he adds a, a, a something behind the be strong and courageous. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at all three, be strong and courageous. And what do we be strong and courageous in doing? And then he gives us the thought. So here we go. Um, verse number 1, verse 6 says this, be strong and courageous. And then he said this, because... All these things that you're going to do, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore their forefathers to give them. This first be strong and courageous that Joshua was told by God, and I believe in the preparation of today and knowing where we were going to go, I think this is the very same challenge that you can inherit in your own life like God is speaking it to you through his word is to be strong and courageous. This is a call to leadership. Now, I don't know what function that you roll in your church, if you're the children's pastor, if you're the children's director, if you're the fourth grade boys teacher, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is hope. You need this message. If you're the worst nursery person, there are diapers that you have to change that you need to be strong and courageous in. <laughs> this is a strong and courageous, and it's called the lead. Joshua had been given a mission. And the lands that were before him were occupied by other people. And he had to take these people who had wandered the wilderness for 40 years. Many of their parents, in fact, all of their parents, in a sense, had died in the wilderness. It was a new generation that he was leading. And his job was to lead them into the promised land. God knows that when a leader doesn't have a mission, they start to slide, they start to lose traction. The people around them start to wonder what is going on. They lose focus. When you don't know where you're going and you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, then those people around you get frustrated. You've seen leadership here tonight. When Josh came up here, he communicated the vision of what Fusion's gonna be this weekend. We're gonna connect with one another. We're gonna, he answered the question why. That's, that's leadership. The people that you lead want to know where you're going. Just as simply as you want to know where your pastor is taking the church. And this is a call that Joshua, you got to be strong and courageous and you got to lead. You got to communicate and motivate and get the people going where they want to go. And if you don't, chaos happens. I need to learn this lesson. Here's why. When my wife and the children get in the car and we're driving and my wife gets hungry or has to go to the bathroom, which is like every three miles, um, she'll say, Kevin, can, can, we, can we get something to eat? And I go, yeah, we're going to stop and get something to eat here real soon. And then we'll take an exit after driving like 30 more miles and we'll get the ex exit. And, 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 you know, there's, there's a McDonald's on the left and a Taco Bell on the right and a Arby's. And, and, and she goes, oh, we'll just go to McDonald's. And I go, you know what? There's something better along the way. There's something further down the road I know. And then we'll pass Taco Bell. She goes, I don't even like Taco Bell, but I got to eat and I got to pee, so just go to Taco Bell. And I go, no, there's, there's something better I know down the road. Maybe a Dairy Queen's down the road. You know what begins to happen in my car? Everybody starts to complain. Everybody gets frustrated. Why? 
because they want to know where we're going to eat and they want to do it now. And because I can't make a decision and I'm the one driving and I'm going, oh, it's just, you know, there's a better spot up ahead. Before you know it, everybody's whining. Connor, have you ever been in a car where that's happened? Yeah, yeah see the scar right here? Yeah. <laughs> that, little, that little sample is what happens in your church all the time when you're the one that's supposed to be leading and you're not leading. Everybody around you gets frustrated. Now, what you might be thinking about is, well, I'm just a fourth grade teacher. Your fourth grade kids want to know where you're going with the class. I'll never forget this when I was a children's pastor in White Center in Seattle because I used to wing it all the time. And I remember the sixth grade um, pastor's daughter, she is, um, uh, her name was Brianne Colby, Brent Colby's sister. She came up to me and she goes, what are you going to do today? And I said, well, I'm going to do this and this and this. She goes, I know. She goes, you just make it up as you go, don't you? That was like a slap across the face. Be be strong and courageous and lead. Let God's mission, what he places on your heart, motivate you to be a person of action. Because when you don't lead, you stop living with a sense of urgency. I told my children's pastor three months ago, Her name is Lindsay, I love her. Um, I sat down with her and I said, you need to lead with a pit in your stomach. You need to have such a vision that you're scared. Not in fear, but there's this knot in your stomach of a dream that God is giving you because it's beyond what you can accomplish. What's the vision that you have that you're talking about that if God doesn't show up, you'll never accomplish it. I wanna lead leaders that lead with a pit in their stomach, that have a dream that's beyond what they could ever think of being accomplished. That's why God told Joshua to be strong and courageous because you're gonna take this promised land and they have to cross a river at flood stage and then it parted. And he's going to have to get up in front of him and go, okay, now guess what we're going to do? We're going to march around a wall 13 times. And then we're going to look at this wall after the seventh day and after the sixth time around and go, ah! And then it's going to come down. Could you imagine being Joshua and having to communicate that plan to the Israelites? That's the stupidest plan in the Bible. Think about it. That's why God told Joshua to be strong and courageous. Because Joshua was going to do things that would only happen if God let him. So my question for you, what are you thinking? What are you dreaming? What is the God-sized dream that puts a pit in your stomach for the class that you lead, for the preschool that you lead, that God is whispering to you saying, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. When I moved to Canvas, uh, it was called Christian Center, um, the church was running about 500 people, and um, we had a really bad reputation in the community, and we had this orchestra and a choir and a, mu- a, a Christmas musical, and um, we, we needed to make some changes because we were on a decline, weren't doing too well, and so I began to, to make some changes, and um, one of those changes was um, bringing Josh over to be our children's pastor. We got rid of the orchestra. We got rid of the choir. Um, we, we got rid of some people that didn't like me. Um, well, actually, they got rid of themselves. Um, we, we got rid of a, um, some other things. Um, and I had a, a fire chief take me out for coffee. And I was just trying to go and do what I believe God had given me the vision to do. And I was trying to figure it out, and I was trying to, trying to do the best of my ability. And this fireman guy sat me down. We were at Starbucks. I still remember the table we were sitting at. And he said, I think you're making changes too fast. And I go, why do you say that? And he goes, because I've been where you've been. And um, I had a a passion to make changes at the fire department. And I was sending soldiers, um, his firemen, into burning buildings, and we did not have the right kind of equipment. And um, so I, I needed to make changes so we could put them in the right kind of equipment. And he goes, I lost a, a lot of people doing this. Um, but it had to be done. And I'm just telling you, Kevin, from my experience, you're doing what I did. You're making changes too fast. 
And I listened to that, and, I, and then I thought this question. I said, um, Randy, um, if you were back in that situation, would you make the same changes as quickly as you did, reflecting on that? And he goes, well, I have to. I go, well, why? He goes, because I'm sending firemen into a burning building they need protected. I go, Randy, you're telling me to slow down, but you have this pit in your stomach that you couldn't send people into a burning building that's on fire. I have a whole community that's going to hell. It's a lot hotter there. I gotta make changes faster. You're really encouraging me. He's like, this is not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and I go, no, we got people. We got people whose lives are on the line. I gotta be strong and courageous. I gotta make bigger decisions. And I gotta lead faster. And I gotta have this pit in my stomach to go to a place I've never been before. We gotta do this. And he's like, you are, you are helpless. He's one of the best people in my church right now. And our church has never burned down, and that's a good thing. <laughs> What's your mission? What's God calling you to do? Here's a simple question. What's the fire burning in your heart? Put in the pit in your stomach to do the dream that God wants you to do. And he whispers to you, be strong and courageous and lead. Second thing he says to us, we see it in verse um, not a seven. He says this, be strong and very courageous. He adds the word very here. I think it's awesome. This is the one he wants us to focus on even more. He says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Then, then, oh, that you may be successful wherever you go. I love what he says here in verse eight. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Know it, understand it, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. This is a call to relationship. This is a call to relationship. So you're first called to lead, but second then to be, to, to be successful, you have to be, um, have a relationship with God. And isn't it interesting of all of the ones that he would say be strong and very courageous, it's, it's, the call to relationship? Why do you have to be strong and courageous when it comes to relationship with God? I think that's an interesting question to think about and, and, and to ponder. As I look at this and I contemplated it, I thought, you know, Joshua could not accomplish what God was calling him to do if he wasn't in connection with God. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. God was the strength that was going to be behind him. How does he even know to march around a wall 13 times unless the commander of the Lord's army shows up and gives him the plan? You have to know who the one that is calling you to do this. And I think what's so hard about that and the reason why it creates courageous is because the hardest person you're ever going to lead is you. The greatest mystery you ever see is when you look in the mirror and the person looking back at you is the biggest mystery of all. And so he says, be strong and courageous, really, and no relationship starting with knowing yourself, and the way you know yourself is really knowing God. And what happens is we are busy people. I mean, how many of you just want to crash right now? You know, like, Kevin, be done, I just want to go to the hotel, sit in the hot tub, make my own bubbles and rest. <laughs> I was in kids' ministries, they just come out naturally. Because we go, 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 go. I have five kids. I'm going, 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 going. And I think what can happen is it takes a lot of strength to slow down and meditate on the word. It takes a lot of courage to say no so you can create the time that you need to soak in the word of God, to understand it, to pray, to take time to listen. I love my wife. I've been married 21 years to her. And um, we were on a walk uh, several um, months ago during the beginning of the summer. And, and we were walking along, and, and I said, what do you think of our marriage? That's a hard question to ask. It's a scary question to ask. She goes, oh, I think it's good. I go, do you like our kids? She goes, everyone but my son. No, she didn't say that. I'm just joking. <laughs> she goes, yeah, I, I love them. I go, it's good. I go, what, do you th what, what did we want our marriage to look like when we were just falling in love? Like, what, what, would, what do we would have wanted? So we begin to dream on this walk. When, if we were 20 years old, how we would have described our marriage after 21 years. We said we'd go on a lot more walks. We'd go to dinner a lot more often. We'd do some other things a lot more often. But my son's here.
Um, we, we'd be more intentional uh, um, about communicating what's going on in each other. She's a teacher, and I, she'd be more intentional. So we decided, here it is, we decided, you know what we need to do? We need to be more intentional about living the kind of marriage that 20-year-olds would have described, not what 41-year-olds were experiencing. It, it revolutionized our marriage. We, we go on more walks. We spend more time staying up at night talking in our bed now and other things. Tuesdays and Thursdays and Friday afternoons. Is this recorded? Is this broadcasting? Here's what I say. You have to be intentional about creating the relationships that you want. You have to be intentional about creating the relationship with God that you desire. It's not going to just naturally happen. In the busyness of your schedule, in the busyness of your time, it's not like you, all of a sudden you're going to go, I have a great relationship with God. And you can only go to the well so many times when you're spending all your time sharing the truth. And you're organizing your kids' ministries, and you're organizing your classroom, and, you, and you're dreaming, and you're giving, and you're giving, and you're giving, and you're giving. Eventually your well runs, die, runs dry. If you're not filling it, it runs dry. We had these two young gals leading worship at our church the other day, and I was sitting back there listening to their worship, and they were, they were leading, and they have beautiful voices. And, and the band was doing a phenomenal job supporting behind them, and, and the, the haze was great, and the volume was perfect, and, 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 and people were worshiping, and they were singing with all that they had. And I thought to myself as I was listening to them sing, I go, this is so shallow. They were great singers, but they had no wealth of love for God in it. So I pulled them aside into the back and I said, you know what, you're a great singer and you're on the stage doing a great job and you're looking good. There is a shallowness to your relationship with Jesus. You're not investing in it. And when you get up to sing, you're having a great voice, but there's, de there's, there's a shallowness. There's no depth to your relationship with God, and it's obvious to see that. And they both begin to cry because I'm right, and they're being called on it. And how often in our ministry, when, when God is telling us to be strong and courageous, have we allowed our relationship with the Most High, our relationship with the one who gave his life for us, we've allowed that relationship to get a little bit shallow. And now we're just running on things that we know, but it's not the relationship here. It's just the things that we say. And it's allowed our ministry to get shallow and empty and weak. And maybe God's whispering in your ear today, be strong and very courageous and come run into me and let me fill you with who I am and how about how about we go on a walk and we talk about what our relationship could be like and then we become intentional about living that way where I speak to you and you lean into me and I develop you and shape you and you respond to that, and we make a difference in the ministries and the lives that we live around us. And you know what? That's scary. That's scary. Here's what I've determined about me and what's happening at Canvas Church right now. Real honest with you. I'm in over my head. The challenges that are before me right now in the church, we just went to our third multi-site. We're getting ready to launch our fourth. We just broke the 4,000 mark the last two weeks. I'm in over my head, but I'm not in over my heart because Jesus is with me. And so I can go to things that I can't even ask the questions for. I'm in over my head, but I'm not in over my heart because I know who God is. I have a relationship with him, and he encourages me, and he supports me, and he strengthens me. I want you to be strong and courageous and lead. Get in over your head and then be strong and courageous. Don't get in over your heart. And then we go to the third one here. Are you with me tonight? 
Then the, then the last one here, number three, is be strong and courageous. And here's what he says, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? I like this spot right here. So he says, be strong and courageous and lead. Be strong and courageous and meditate on the word. Don't join. And then he comes back to him on verse 9. He goes, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. I, and there's just, I, God has a good sense of humor there. He's like, hello, hello. That's what he's saying. I think it's cool. Okay. <laughs> Don't be a boring Bible reader. Put some, okay. Have I not commanded you, you idiot? No, it doesn't say that. In the Hebrew it does, but not in the... No. <laughs> Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. And then let's know what he says. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Here's what he comes. This is a call to Resilience. Because what he's calling you to do is going to look impossible. And you're going to need his power. And then you got to go do it. And that's scary. It's scary to cancel the choir when half the church is in the choir. But God goes, I want to take you to a new place. It's scary to cancel the orchestra when the tuba player wants to throw it at you. But that's where God's calling you. This is a call to resilience. Joshua had a job to do, and it wasn't going to be easy. And God never intends for it to be easy. I think we want it to be easy, easy but when God calls us to do something, he calls us to do things that are beyond what we could ever imagine or dream. And he calls us to do those things so that when we take our feet and begin to move the direction he wants you, guess who gets the glory for it? He does. If we could do it in our own power and in our own strength, he wouldn't need to get the glory. We could accept it. But when we begin to go to a land that God has never, that God has taken us to, that we could never get on our own, here's what's going to happen. Along the way, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to wonder, is this the right thing to be doing? Anytime you begin to take ground from the enemy, you're going to have, um, you're going to have people step up and say, this is a bad plan. This is a poor idea. This is stupid. Satan's great at bringing discouragers along. He's great at it. And sometimes they come in a 65-year-old grandma who says, we've never done it that way before. Or it comes from a preschool mother. My kid is gluten-free. <laughs> and can't have peanuts. And whatever else is going on. And you're just like, there's a great church down the road, and they serve gluten-free goldfish. Are goldfish gluten-free? No. <laughs> See, there's an early childhood director in there. <laughs> no, and they don't have peanuts, and they're not made around peanuts. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. <laughs> Joshua is amazing, because I love to put myself in his story. Think about what Joshua was thinking the third time around the wall on that third day. Let's go, people. We're marching around the wall. Go to bed, get up the fourth morning, sun's coming up, beautiful. Hey, we're going to march around the wall again. <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> you think he might have got discouraged going around the wall? Yeah. Fifth day. Let's go. We're marching around the wall again. People are like, I don't want to get up. My legs are sore. Go, oh, come on. It's going to be great. They're going to throw stuff on us. Have you seen the Veggie Tale version? <laughs> yeah, it's powerful. Fifth day, sixth day, here we go. I, I bet you, Joshua was like, I'm not going out of my tent. Oh, they're still there. You ever done that? I don't want to go to church this Sunday. Oh, if we could just have five Saturdays. You ever get there? And you know what I think about the word is discourage? Catch this. The word discourage, discouraged, really discourage comes from Lacking courage. This is what he's saying. Have I not commanded you? Do not lack courage. Here's what God is saying to Joshua in a very loving way. Get out of your tent and get marching. Come on. I'm going to go with you. I got you. I got this. I got this. I got you. Go, go, go. Don't lack courage. 
Don't let fear and discouragement be immobilizing. In fact, if I was to say one thing at Fusion this whole weekend that I would want you to remember, it's this statement right here. I believe, and i got to be careful in saying this, I need you to know my heart. I believe the church of today is full of cowards. Of children's leaders that are just doing the things that they've always done. And they're, and, and they're sitting in their tent and they're not taking new land. They're not taking the land God wants them. And we serve a creative God who is stirring and has plans for these kids. No one cares for kids like God cares for kids. That's where the harvest is plenty, and that's where the laborers are few. Why is this place not crammed with children's leaders? Because we're not casting a clear enough vision to communicate, hey, this is where the harvest is at. This is where God wants us to rise up. What God needs to do in this place and God needs to do in your heart, he needs to put a burden in your heart to raise up leaders around you to take land that you've never taken before, that you're having to rent buses full to get people here because there's so much excitement about what's happening in kids' ministries. Do you know if you want to get the greatest return on a million dollars when it comes to peer souls, you invest that million dollars into kids' ministries and you'll get your greatest return on salvations from that. That's what business that we're in. But I think we get comfortable. We don't want to do anything to lose ground. We don't want to fail. So we don't become strong and courageous and we don't lead anymore, we just do. We don't get strong and courageous and run to God because every time we run to God, this emotion begins to burn in us because he's asking us to do something we can't do. So it's easier not to run there and hear the thing that we have to do, it's just easier just to keep doing the same thing. It sounds spiritual. And then the thirdly is, it's hard work. It takes resilience. And Sometimes you're going to want to quit. So I tell you this story. I had this idea. I like this story. I had an idea in 1998 to do a kids conference in 2000. And so we pulled a little team together, and we called it Kids 2000. Isn't that a creative name? <laughs> I made it up all by myself. And um, we, we um, rented Overlake. And we, they charged us a ton of money, the jerks. And um, I mean, they're good people. But, and so we started advertising on the radio. How many went to Kids 2000? I'm just curious. Yeah, we're all like 50, 60 years old now, except for Nick, who just doesn't age. <laughs> you look the same as when I saw you. It's amazing. But you have five kids now. Um, you have a good marriage. <laughs> Tuesday, Thursday, Friday afternoons. And, um, <laughs> and Shelly Sunberg's like, I'm engaged. I'm engaged. Um, so we started this event called Kids 2000. And I'm excited for for it, and we planned on 2,000 kids coming. So I wrote the budget at 2,000 kids. But you know, when you have a vision from God, and you have great faith, you don't stick to the budget. So I spent like 2,500 kids were coming. 1,900 kids showed up. And if you, that's 600 kids. So I lost $30,000 on the event. I was a volunteer for the network at the time, and Warren Bullock was the superintendent, like the Pope. And um, <laughs> I was downstairs at Westwood, and I, the, the, the network at that time was going through a very financial crisis. It was, just a, it was a hard time for the network. And they didn't have any money. And they, they had fired and let some people go. I just wasted $30,000. I understand the word discouraged a lot. And I had back then what was called a flip phone. And it had a little screen on the outside and it popped up the Northwest Ministry Network, what was called the Northwest District at the time. 
And it was Warren Bullock calling me to ask how Kids 2000 went. I flipped the phone open. I said, hello. And he goes, hey, Kevin. I was at Kids 2000. I loved it. Thanks for, for dreaming. I had a big dream. And I said, Pastor Warren, I need to tell you something. I lost money. And he goes, oh, how much you lose? And I said, $30,000. Are you there? Because <laughs> that's a lot of money, Kevin. And I know, I'm so sorry. I go, I can pay it back somehow. Um, and he goes, Kevin, let's call that an investment into you. No better words I think have ever been breathed over me that took a deflated sail that wanted to quit, that screwed up. Kevin, let's call that an investment into you. It's like you went into my sail. I'm like, really? I got this idea. It's called Kids 2001. <laughs> and we did it. And we lost money. And then we did Nitro, the power surge after that. And then Nitro. And now we're heading to Nitro 2.0. Be strong and courageous and lead. Be strong and very courageous and pursue a relationship with God. Be strong and courageous and do not be discouraged. Why? Here it is. For the Lord, your God is with you wherever you go. Now, maybe that's just an Old Testament promise. And so I studied this text as I bring it ready to close and we're going to get ready to respond to what God has spoken to us. And I thought, you know, this is what God told Moses. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you, Joshua 1.5. In Genesis chapter 28, God told Jacob, Jacob, I will be with you wherever you go. Moses would repeat this to Joshua when Moses was in charge in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Do you know that when Gideon and his 300 soldiers were ready to go fight, God spoke to Gideon and said, Gideon, I will be with you. When the Jewish exiles were returning from Babylon and Isaiah and they were discouraged, God said to them, I will be with you. David, when he would get ready to die and he had the whole temple planned out, what a vision. He said to Solomon, son, as God was with me, he will be with you. And then we see in Matthew, New Testament, Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. And then Jesus, at the very end of Matthew, looked at his disciples and he said these words, I will be with you to the very end of the age. And then just when you think there's no more, the writer of Hebrews quotes Joshua. One five, And he grabs the promise in the Old Testament 
and he brings it into the New Testament so that you and I can inherit that truth. So Fusion, here's what I pray over you. Be strong and courageous and lead. Lead with a pit in your stomach that you know God has to show up for where he's taken you. Be strong and courageous and have a relationship with him like you never had before. Let him fill your well to overflowing. 